Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go get down on my knees because I'm ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning. Are you ready to get into the word of the Lord? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. I know that you guys, as you already, you can stand. It's all right. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. Listen, we don't come into this place to hear from a man. We don't come into this place to hear from a woman. You didn't come to hear from Pastor Jim or Pastor Dan or Pastor Deborah. You came to hear from God. So why don't we go before the Lord in honor and reverence in our hearts so that the Lord would speak to us today. So I'm going to get down on my knees today. Father, in the name of Jesus Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why, Father? Because that is where your presence is. Your word says that when two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of them. So, Father, we thank you that you are here in the presence in the midst of us today. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church to be entertained. But, God, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit minister to us today, to speak to us, to show us your word, to, 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 to plant the seed of the word in our hearts. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit would help us to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what you have have us to hear today. And, Lord, I thank you for your blessings and your presence on this place. And, Lord, we don't want to ask that blessing just for ourselves, but, Lord, as for our, our, for our brothers and sisters all across the world and all over the Inland Empire that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers. So, Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Baptist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian brothers and sisters, our, our Methodist and Lutheran brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon Emmanuel Baptist, upon the Way World Outreach, upon Harvest Christian Fellowship and Sandals in the Grove. Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon uh, Abundant Living, Father, Oak Valley, Ecclesia, Inland Christian Center. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody, but Lord, as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to serve you, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you will accomplish in your body. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to get into the word of the Lord this morning as we continue our study of Hebrews. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles, the sword of the Spirit. Let's open it up back up to uh, Hebrews in the fifth chapter. I tell you, my Bible just naturally kind of falls open to Hebrews. For those of you who are just joining us, we go, we go through the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept. What does that mean? That means that the Bible was written that way, thought upon thought, word on word. So we're going to study it that way. So we've been in the book of Hebrews now for quite some time. We're finding ourselves now in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And I'll tell you, it's just amazing what God is has in store for us, his people, and his church. So as we continue our study of Hebrews in the fifth chapter, we're going to continue off where Pastor Jim left off. He left off on part one last week. The title of this morning's message is The Battle Between Pride and Humility. I don't know about you, but I know that there's a, that we have a two, two, kind of a two-faced person on the inside, one that desires to be a, a humble person, one that desires to, to help out those in need, and then there's that other side of us, that, that side of pride that's just kind of ingrained naturally into, into mankind. There's something about pride. We don't, have to, uh, we don't have to work at it. We don't have to push for it. It just happens. It just kind of comes. And so there's that ongoing battle, there's that ongoing struggle between us in our, in our spiritual lives and our walks that, that, that the Bible tells us, Jesus teaches us that we ought to be humble, so we, we desire for that. But then there's that, uh, that never-ending uh, striving or in, internal striving for pride. And, and so we're talking today about the battle between the pride and humility. And we're going to look at Hebrews, the fifth chapter, looking at Jesus Christ as the ultimate example. I mean... Who better to look at as an example on how to live our lives than Jesus himself? So today I want to take you into the word. If you've got your Bibles, let's go back to Hebrews in the fifth chapter. Hebrews in the fifth chapter, continuing on verse number five. And it says, so Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. We're talking about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. But it was he, he speaking of God, but it was he, God, who said to him, Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What better example to learn a life of humility than from Jesus Christ who came, knowing 
his plan, who came knowing the idea of redemption, who came knowing the need for man to have a savior. He was God. The Bible tells us, we'll see it in a moment and, and later on today, that, that he was at all points equal with God. He was not just some, some magical angel. He was not some high positioned authority. He was God himself who came and brought himself to the lowly position of a man humbled himself, and from the very beginning of his roots, from the very moment of his birth when he was born in that manger, you know, Jesus wasn't born in the high-tech medical centers. He wasn't born with, uh, with many servants b uh, beside, his, beside Mary. You know, Jesus was born alone in a manger with the stench of animals and livestock and, and feces, and, and he was there alone with his mother and his father. He was born in a humble, brought up in a humble beginning and ended his life on a humble ending on a cross, a spectacle for people to see. What better example for us to learn a life of humility than to look after Jesus Christ who did not glorify himself. Now let me not, let me, let me not be mistaken in the sense that when people asked him, when those who questioned him who, who he was, he made no mistake and he made no qualms about telling them who he was. But, you know, Jesus didn't glorify himself. He made it a point to minister to the needy, to the broken, to the sick. You know, he spent his time in the company of tax collectors and in the, in the company of, of, the, of the lepers and the blind. Rather than, he wasn't a status climber. He wasn't somebody looking to, to minister to the royalty. He came to those who were in need. What an example for us to learn in our own lives, a life of humility, a life of, uh, uh, to, to minister, to, to be, a, to be a, an example for God to shine through us. In those in need. Now, we talked last week about the definitions of pride and the definitions of humility, simple definitions. Pride is simply self exaltation. When you have a sense of pride, you, you, you felt this before. I think we've all been there. You've been proud of something. You, wanna, you want everybody to know about it. You want to lift yourself up. You want to get up on that pedestal so everybody can see your accomplishments. So pride is self-exaltation. Humility is simply God-exaltation in the sense that you're not trying to lift yourself up. You're not trying to make yourself better, but rather you're trying to make God look better within you so that when people see you, they don't see how good you look. They don't see how successful you are, what clothes you're wearing, but rather when people see you, they see God inside of you. And that's what humility is, is God-exaltation. And if you remember, one of the things that Pastor Jim talked about last week, if you weren't here, I encourage you to grab the CD of last week's message or go online where you can listen to it for free. Last week, Pastor Jim brought us to Proverbs. Why don't we go ahead and put it up on the overhead in Proverbs, talking about some of the benefits of living a life of humility. It says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Last week when we talked about the rewards of a, of a humble life, we, we saw these things, riches. Now I want to remind you, don't think solely upon finances. Riches, don't limit, you know, riches aren't limited to money. How about riches in your relationships? Riches in your love? Riches in your children being healthy and successful? How about honor? We all want honor from men. We all want people to look upon us and say, man, that person, we, I, they deserve me to listen to them. But how about this? How about honor from God? How about having God looking down upon what we do in our lives through a humble lifestyle, looking and saying, you know what, I'm going to honor what they put their hand to. I'm going to honor them in what they do. I don't know about you, but I surely desire to have the honor of God above all things. And finally, we talked about last week, life. The benefits of a humble lifestyle is life. You know, nobody wants to live this world each day or live this life in this world each day. Get up and breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Go back to bed, get up the next morning, breathe in, breathe out. And just exist. We're not here to just exist. We're here to have life. Jesus said he came to give us life and life more abundantly. God wants us to have an abundant, a prosperous life, a life of fulfillment. And when we live a life of humility, we have God that shines through us. There is a purpose for our lives. There is a legacy that we can leave behind by touching somebody else beside us that we can leave for generations, a legacy behind us through God in our lives. So there's all sorts of benefits to living a humble lifestyle, and I encourage you to grab a hold of that message. You can listen to it in more detail. But today I want to talk to you about the workings of humility, about how humility works. And I'm going to bring to you three simple things, three subjects. I'm sure we can talk about many, many, many more. But today I want to talk to you about three things. And each one of these three things that we're going to talk about this morning start with the words, it is our responsibility. You see, humility doesn't come naturally. I don't know if anybody's ever been there or anybody can, can relate, but I don't know, it's easy to get prideful. You do something pretty good and you look at it and say, man, I'm the, I'm the man. I'm the man. 
Pride comes naturally. It just, it's just part of the human nature. But humility to lower ourselves and, and to shed ourselves of that natural sense of pride, it doesn't come natural. So we have to take responsibility in, in our actions, in our lives, to ensure that we live a humble life, to ensure that we, we operate in humility so that God can be the one that is exalted through us rather than ourselves. Because I don't know about you, but at the end of my days... When, 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 when I'm long gone, I want my legacy not to just be, wow, okay, he was a nice guy. Oh, all right, he, he was successful. Okay, he had a couple of kids and they all... No, that's not what I want to be. I want to be... I want people to look at me and say, wow, you know what? He humbled himself. He, he was never prideful. He didn't lift himself up. But you could see God operating in his life. I want people to see me. I don't know about you, but I want people to see me. And I want them to see God inside of me, not me. Because when they see me, and if they see me and they see me, let me tell you something, they're getting shortchanged, and I myself am getting shortchanged because it's not about me, it's about God. It's about glorifying God and exalting God. Are you with me today? So we're going to talk about some things that are our responsibility. Simple ideas, simple, simple things. And you know, who better to look at, who better to take an example from than Jesus Christ himself? We talked about his humble beginnings and his humble endings, but what about the middle? What about in the middle between the beginning and the end? Jesus exemplified over and over and over the humble lifestyle. And I want to take some, some things from Jesus and I want to look at them today. So we're going to talk about the workings of humility. How humility works based on our responsibility. Number one for this morning in the workings of humility is it is our responsibility to remain humble. Now, I don't know about you. I'm sure you've probably been there. I can say that there have been many occasion, many occasion in my life where I have been humbled. Has anybody ever been humbled? I remember there was a time about a decade ago when we were building this sanctuary and my supervisor had laid out all the video cameras in their, in their respective positions so that he could show Pastor Jim what the cameras were going to look like. And I, at the time, I was in charge of setting up the audio video equipment in the youth auditorium. Well, the cameras for the sanctuary hadn't come in yet. They, the order was delayed. And so we took all the audio and video equipment out of the youth auditorium and set it up in the, in the main sanctuary so Pastor Jim could see the example of what they were going to look like. Well, I didn't know this. And my responsibility was to set up the audio and video equipment in the youth auditorium. So my supervisor had set all the cameras up. And I didn't know, so I came and said, what the heck are they all doing in here? So I tore everything down, and I put it back in the youth auditorium. And then Pastor Jim came out and met with my supervisor to see what the cameras were going to look like. And my supervisor was like, I have no clue what happened. I had everything set up. I came here early today so that it would all be done. And I jumped in there and I said, well, just because he didn't do his job in ordering his stuff early doesn't mean that the youth department should suffer for it. Humbling moment to follow. Now, for those of you who don't know, Pastor Jim is my dad, so he had one of those boss-slash-fatherly moments where he really got into my face, more so that a dad would do than a boss, and really kind of just made it a point to humble me. <laughs> and I can look back on that, and I can remember that. It was a humbling moment. There was no more pride left. I was, I was lower than the floor. If I could crawl into a hole, I would be there. I'm sure that in work or in your work or in your life, maybe with your husbands or your wives, whatever it might be, you've been humbled or you've felt that experience in some form or fashion as well. The fact of the matter is, is that life continues to go on. And then as time goes on, as we build life experience, as years go by and as, 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 as weeks turn into months and months turn into years and years turn into decades, those humbling experiences become a thing of the past. And we, we, we begin to forget how we felt in that moment. And, and that natural sense of pride comes in. Well, in order for us to live a humble life, to follow after what God has said, we have got to continually remember to remain humble. To stay in that status. To stay in that mindset of humility. Because otherwise, that natural tendency of pride will creep itself in. And we will not only rob ourselves of our legacy, but will rob those around us of seeing the true nature of what God has for us. To see God inside of us. Because now all of a sudden we've got pride in our lives instead of humility. You, you understand what I'm saying? Let me show you what Jesus says. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke in the 14th chapter. Luke in the 14th chapter. Here Jesus is teaching. Luke in the 14th chapter. Jesus is teaching, and he's using this example. And I want to I kind of paint the picture for you. 
So we're going to read this example, and then after we read what Jesus is saying, I want to kind of take you on a, on a visual and a mental journey. We're going to go there together. I know it's early, so if you're thinking, man, Pastor Luke, I'm still tired. I just got up. The kids were cranky. I'm going to kind of shake it off because I need you to get with me on your thinking caps. I need you to get with me on your imagination. We're going to go somewhere together, okay? But here we see in Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus is teaching. He's, he's preaching. And he's using this example in Luke, the 14th chapter, in verse number 8, speaking about humility, speaking about remaining humble in our lives. Jesus uses this example, and he says, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast. Now, hold on. Right there. How many of you have ever been invited to or have been to a wedding reception? Is it, is for the most part, I would say, probably if you've never been to a wedding reception, you maybe, maybe you've been to a party or a dinner or something like that where there was free food. How about that? Let's just say, you ever been to a place where they gave you free food? Hallelujah for wedding receptions and free food. Amen? So much better than McDonald's for the night, I'll tell you that. So here Jesus is painting the picture and he's using this example of a, of a wedding feast, but this applies to life in general. And he says, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, the person who invited you. And when he who invited you and him, the person that's more honorable than you, come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes to you, that he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Listen to what Jesus says here in verse number 11. He says, for those who exalt themselves, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I told you to put on your imagination caps. Come on, let's go on a journey. Let's go to that wedding reception. I know it's 10 o'clock in the morning, but let's all go to that wedding reception. You've been there. You've walked in there. You've seen the tables and the tablecloths set up, and it's a dim, dim lit room. You know, they got some atmosphere. They got the lights. They got the Kenny G music going on, and, it's, and the people are kind of mingling here and there. You've seen it. The tables are all scattered, and then there's that one table. I remember one wedding I went to, they had a table, and it was up on a stage, and it was real long, and the bride and the groom, they sat in the middle of that table, and then on each side of that table was the best man and the maid of honor and then, and then, and then the corresponding members of the wedding party. Can you guys kind of imagine that? Let's just think, there's a, there's a big table up front, and everybody else has got their tables, okay? So here you come, you're going to that wedding party, right? You're going to that reception. And you know the bride or you know the groom. You think, all right, I know them. I'm in, man. I'm, I'm in the in group. You got your suit on or you got that dress going. You're looking good. You got your hair all done up. And now you're going into that wedding reception. And you see that table up high and you say, oh, that's a nice table. Hey, listen, you know what? My buddy, he invited me to this wedding personally. He would want me to sit next to him. I know it. So you're going to go, you go up on that stage and you sit on that table. And there's a little placard on that table that says the, the maid of honor or best man. But, you know, you weren't paying attention. You were talking. You were, you were pointing at everybody. Look, hey, how you doing? So you weren't paying attention to that seat. And then all of a sudden, you know, you know what happens next. The DJ gets on the, uh, on the PA system, on the sound system. He says, ladies and gentlemen. And he starts to begin to in introduce the wedding party. You know what I'm talking about? And the bride and the groom, they come in and they're doing their little dance because they're, they're married. And you're sitting at that table, right? And then all of a sudden, the best man comes. And the groom comes. And the groom taps you on the shoulder. He says, hey, oh, hey, how you doing? Hey, listen, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's, this is the seat for the best man. You see his, his name placard, and you say, oh, oh, my goodness, I, I didn't know. I thought this was for me. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's all right. You know, because the, they're not going to try to, they're not going to be all offended at you. It's, they just got married. They're happy. But what they, I got a table for you. It's okay. I got a seat for you. It's right over there. You see, oh, I know it's kind of hard to see because it's in the dark corner. <laughs> but I got you over there. And, and, and you get up, and everybody's looking at you because they were wondering, who's this guy sitting at this big old table? Don't they, doesn't this guy know? That's the maid of honor in the best man seat. So everybody's watching you, and they go, and they watch you walk over to that dark corner. And it's the, you, you've been there, you've been to this wedding reception, where it's nobody that you know. Everybody's got stinky breath, and they're talking about Star Trek or something that you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said? He said, whoever exalts himself will be lowered. So he says, in life, what you ought to do is take the attitude of going, and you go into the wedding reception, you say, you know what, man, I don't know where I'm supposed to seat. I didn't see the seating chart. I'm just going to go sit over here. I'm going to go introduce myself to these people. I'm going to go sit with them. I don't know. But I'm here for the bride and groom. I just want to support them. I just want them to know that I love them and I'm here. I'm here. It's not about me. It's about them. And he says, you go sit at the low table. And then all of a sudden, the bride or the groom, they see you and say, hey, what are they doing over there? 
there. And they come over to you at that table that you don't know anybody about. And you're looking at their conversations and you're nodding, which you don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're all for the other, they're, they were for the other person's party. You don't know any of them. And the bride and the groom, they come and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, what are you doing over here? I got a seat for you over here at the head table, man. Come on. I got a placard for you. You didn't see your name. You say, oh, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. I just, I was in here. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to look at everybody and be like, hey, guys, did you stand up? Hey, it was nice to meet you. Oh, man, it was, I'll see you out there later on. But you know you're going to that table where you get to get dinner first. And Jesus says, whoever lowers himself will be exalted. It's the same idea with us in our lives. The moment we think that we're anything, the moment we think we're all that, the moment we think we got something to offer, that's when all of a sudden we're going to be lowered down. But the moment we realize, hey, listen, in the grand scheme of things, we got nothing. In the grand scheme of things, our issues are small. In the grand scheme of things, the life and the legacy that we live is a short vapor amount of time. And then all we got to do and all we can do it through our life is live a life of humility so that God would be glorified and God would be exalted through our life. And through that exaltation of God, God will bring us to a place of honor. Remember, we talked about riches, honor, and life. So we have got to remind ourselves it is our responsibility to remain humble. Are you with me this morning? Number two for this morning about the workings of humility. It is our responsibility to be a servant and not the served. You know, as life goes by, we've been trained from children to climb the ladder of success. And as life goes by, maybe you started at a job and you're advancing that job now. You started as a low-paid employee, as, a, as an entry-level job. And as decades have gone by, you worked your way through the ranks. And now you're a manager or a supervisor or, 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 or a VP or something of that nature. It's easy to forget what it was like to be that low-level employee or that servant employee. And now all of a sudden you remember, you, you forget what it's like to be the servant, and now it's about service to you. Hey, listen, we all want to have success. We all would love to have that butler or that, that, that person that would cook us dinner every night. I know I sure would. Hallelujah. But the fact of the matter is it's not about being the served, but rather about being the servant. You see, what better example to look at than Jesus Christ himself, right? And who came to this world uh, as equal with God, in, in the position of God, and lowered himself to mankind, born in a manger, and came to serve? He said he came to seek and save the lost. So what better example to look at than Jesus Christ? We've got to remember that it is our responsibility to be the servant and not the serve. I remember I was watching this show uh, about CEOs and they would go into the workplace and they would be undercover and they would see what life was like as a low-level employee. And so many of them had forgotten what it was like to work in those mundane or monotonous positions. And at the end of the show, everybody gets together and they cry. And, and the CEO, he's, they're, they're crying and the workers are crying. And the CEO says, I'm, I'm going to make sure that we change this and I'm going to make sure and I'm going to give you a college scholarship and I'm going to help you pay your medical bills or I'm going to pay off your house. And they remember that as a, as a leader, the more of a leader we become, the higher we come on the ladder of success in our lives, the more we ought to be servants to those underneath us. Did you get that? Did you understand what we're saying? And through the example of Jesus Christ, who is high above all, the higher you and I climb on the ladder to success in any point of our lives, the more we should be servants to those underneath us so that we can build them up underneath us. Why? So that God be glorified. You're in the book of Luke. Turn with me a couple chapters over. Turn with me a couple chapters over to Luke in the 22nd chapter. Luke in the 22nd chapter. Here we're finding Jesus and his disciples in the time that we call the Lord's Supper. They're speaking and they're, and they're having dinner together. You know this. This is that, that famous painting from, I think it was Leonardo da Vinci. And they're all sitting at that table. And here's a funny thing going on in Luke, the 22nd chapter. In the 25th verse, the disciples are kind of quarreling amongst themselves. Who will be greater? Who will sit highest next to Jesus? And, and, and Peter says, oh, it is I. And John says, oh, I would love to sit at the right hand of Jesus and have my head on. And, and Jesus says to them, he responds to them during dinner. And look what he says in Luke, the 22nd chapter in verse number 25. He says to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. What he's saying is the lords or the kings exercise their ruler, the rulership or their rule over the people below them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. He says those who exercise rule over the people below them, they call themselves benefactors. What is a benefactor? A benefactor is somebody who offers help. 
We, we can relate to this in some sense. We have representatives in our local, state, and federal level of, 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 of leadership. And you see, especially during this election time, you talk about them, you hear about them on their campaign trail. Oh, I was at so-and-so of a factory, and I was talking to so-and-so of a person, and I was telling them personally what I have done to help them, and how I helped build them, and how I helped lift them up, and how I got them a good job. And you know, we all know as, as, as we watch these things, well, that's great, that's wonderful. But we know that once the election's over, once they've been re-elected or once they've been elected, we know that they're going to kind of go back to their general grind and they're going to go back to their offices and they're going to kind of do their own thing. And then once the election process comes back again, they're going to start visiting the people so that they can make an appearance. And I'm not trying to get political. I'm not saying one person is better over the other. That's not where I'm going. But what I'm saying is Jesus says they call themselves helpers over the people that they rule, even though they rule. Why? Because they're trying to make themselves look better. And so he says they calls them, he calls them benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he says, he who is greatest among you, let him be the younger. He who governs as he who serves. For who is greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? And he answers, is it not the one who sits at the table? And listen to what Jesus tells his disciples. I am among you as the one who serves. Now let me ask you an obvious question. Of the 13 people involved in this dinner and this conversation, the 12 disciples plus Jesus, of all of those who are sitting at this table, which is the greatest of all? Who? Jesus, right? I mean, not Peter, not John, not Andrew. No, 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 none of the disciples. Unarguably, unquestionably, Jesus. If there was a comfortable chair, Jesus got the most comfortable chair, right? He was the one that would sit at the head of the table. And here Jesus says to his disciples, I am among you as the one who serves. Now I want to take you back about an hour in time from when he was teaching his disciples. And we're going to take a step back to before dinner. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John in the 13th chapter. John in the 13th chapter. This is just an hour or so before dinner. Before his speech, before he tells them that he is the one that is with them that serves. Now we all understand that Jesus is the greatest of them all. That's unarguable. It's unquestionable. Now look what happens in John the 13th chapter. In John the 13th chapter we read the account of when Jesus removes his clothes, his position, his authority, when people recognize him. You see, he wore something and people knew him. You know the story of the felt board pictures of Jesus wearing a white robe and the blue sash? If that's what Jesus wore, then fine. Just imagine that you know, Jesus takes that white robe and that blue sash off and he girds himself. The Bible tells us he girds himself in a cloth and a towel. He wears the clothes. He puts himself in the clothes and the uniform of a slave. And here he takes the, the feet of his disciples and he begins to wash them. You know the story, perhaps. The disciples say, no, you can't wash our feet. We should wash your feet. And Jesus tells Peter, he says, if you won't let me wash your feet, you can't be my disciple. Because he's teaching them a lesson. Now, in our day and age, we wear flip-flops all day long. And our feet aren't nasty and stanky. Well, well, some of ours. But let me take you back to the time of Jesus. Let me bring, this, let me bring a little bit of reality to you about Jesus washing the feet. They didn't have asphalt and concrete streets. They didn't have sidewalks and gutters. Hey, listen, they didn't have storm drains with the little, you know, little fish on it that says flows to the ocean, do not dump. When it rained, the streets got muddy. They didn't have uh, toilets that they could push a little lever and everything that they put into the toilet goes down to some magical place that they don't have to think about. Oftentimes, especially if you've ever been to a third world country, you know that most of the time they do that business right there in the street. They didn't have places where the, the farmers and the ranchers and those who had cattle and sheep, they would use the same roads that everybody else used to, to herd their livestock to one, from one place to the next. If you've ever been behind a horse or you've ever seen what a horse leaves behind during the parades, you know what animals and livestock do. So here's a street that's muddy, that's covered in feces, that smells, and they didn't have New Balance shoes or Nike shoes. They didn't have Doc Martin steel-toed boots. They had sandals with straps that had a piece of leather that covered the bottom of their feet for protection. That's all that they had. So here's the feet of the disciples, 24 feet in all, if you take 12 and multiply each one of them with two feet. Here's Jesus washing 24 feet that has poo on it, that has dirt on it, that has mud on it, that stinks, that's been in this leather. If you've ever worn leather sandals all day long, you know that your feet have that, oh man, that smell. Whew. 
You know, and when you're walking around, the dust gets on your hands, the dust gets in your hair. But you can wipe that off, you can wash it off, but your feet are caked in it. And here's Jesus lowering himself. The one who says, unarguably the greatest one of all of them, gets down and puts, puts a towel on around him and he washes their feet. And he lowers himself to the position of a servant. And look what he says in John, the 13th chapter, right after he washed their feet. In John, the 13th chapter, verse number 12, Jesus says, so when he had washed their feet, he doesn't say this, but the Bible says, so when he had washed their feet, he had taken their, his garments and sat back down. He, he put his clothes back on. He sat down at the table and he said to them, do you know what I have done for you or done to you? He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for that's what I am. He says, you, you call me your teacher and your master and you say right because that's what I am to you. Verse number 14, look what he says. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You see, what better an example for us to live by than to look at Jesus Christ? The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Bible says no other name is above his name. He is above all things that are named and not are not named. And here he lowers himself to the point where he washes the feet, the stinky, the nasty, the dirt and grime covered feet of his disciples to show them an example of humility to say the higher you are on the, on the food chain, the more of a servant you should become. So that why? So that God would be glorified in your lives. We have got to remind ourselves it is our responsibility to be the servant and not the served. Are you with me today? Yeah. Can I take you to one more? Can, you got time for one more? Can you do one more? Yeah. We're talking about the workings of humility, of how humility works. Number three today, it is our responsibility to submit. It is our responsibility to submit. You may have heard this before, but the word submit, the, the etymology of, of, of submission, the, the meaning behind it comes from two words, sub messio, sub messier, depending on who you want to read, what Latin you want to translate. But basically we understand that the word means that sub, like submarine, means to come under, to be underneath. Messio means the mission. Messie means leadership or rule. To put yourself under the leadership or rule. Put yourself under the mission of somebody else, of something else. You see, humility is submission. Why? Because pride says, I want it to be my way. I want somebody to see that my way is the right way. I want credit for what I've done. But submission says, okay, I'm going to put myself under the authority. I'm going to put myself under the leadership of God, of, 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 what, the, of what God says for my life, and I'm going to allow him to get the credit, him to, get the, to, to have his name on, on the work, not mine, because it's about humility. So it is our responsibility to submit, to, 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 to bring ourselves to a place where we allow God to be the leaders of our lives. Are you with me today? Look what Paul says about Jesus I'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Look what Paul says about Jesus in Philippians in the second chapter. His admonition to the people is in, in verse number 5 in Philippians, the second chapter, verse number 5. He says this. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hey, church, he says, you and I should be like-minded with Jesus Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse number 6 goes on to say... Who being in the form of God, remember I told you that Jesus was equal with God. He was not some magical angel or some subordinate to God. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Verse number 7 comes on to say, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Going on to verse number 8, it says this, it says, and being found in appearance as a man, look what it says, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. You see, humility and obedience come hand in hand. Obedience and submission being the same thing, to come under the rule of somebody else. You see, Jesus knew the plan of God. He humbled himself. He brought himself in the form of a man, and he came knowing the plan of redemption was ahead. And it says that he humbled himself and was obedient to the plan of God, to the mission of God. He submitted to the leadership of God to the point of death, death on the cross. 
You might recall Jesus in the prayer in the garden as he was praying right before he was, his betrayal. He prayed these words. He said, oh, Lord, if it is possible, we'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead. If it is possible, let this cup, take this cup away from me. Meaning, God, if there's another way for me to do this plan of redemption, let's go with that plan. But then look at his response. He says, nevertheless, it's not my will, but yours be done. You see, it wasn't the pain of the cross. It wasn't the suffering and the torture that he was going to face. Because Jesus came at a, with a mindset different than you and I have. We have a mindset of 80 years, 90 years. That's the span of our life. Jesus was there at the beginning of the earth. He'll be there at the, at the end of all things. Jesus has an eternal mindset. So it's not the moment, the, the, the sheer seconds or, or milliseconds in the grand scheme of things of pain that he would endure. But rather, here is Jesus, God himself, come down, never having experienced the burden and the grotesque nature of sin on him. Now all of a sudden being the sin of all men, bearing the weight of all sin, both past, present, and future. And so Jesus says, God, if there's a plan for this redemption to go any other way, why don't we make it happen? The Bible tells us, remember in Hebrews, he didn't glorify himself, but God glorified him. You see, Jesus could have said, all right, God, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to fly through the air. And I'm going to have the legions of tens of thousands of angels all beside me. And we're going to use the power of the Holy Spirit to make every person bow on their knees. And they'll realize right then and there that I am the one. But that wasn't the plan of God. You see, that wasn't how God wanted things to be done. That wasn't how God had things to be done. He needed Jesus to come and die on the cross to bear our sin and our shame so that we could be united with God once again. And so here Jesus says, God, that's my plan. That's my idea. I like it a little bit better. But he says, nevertheless, it's not my plan. It's not my will be done, but yours. And you know the story. The Bible tells us that Jesus embraces his cross as he goes to the hill on Calvary. And he offers his life willingly for you and I. Takes that burden of sin upon his shoulders so that we can be free of our, of our sinful nature. So that we can once again be connected to God. And we ought to take that example of humility, of submission. The ultimate submission going to death, death even to the cross. We ought to take that example in our lives and realize that our pride might say, Hey listen, it's time for, I, I can't do that. The fear, of God, the fear that God is not able to get me through this, the, the lack of trust from God won't, won't see me through this. That's where disobedience comes from. You see, disobedience comes from either your pride saying, hey, listen, I'm too low for that. that, that's, that's, or that I'm too high for that. That's a little low, but low my position. Or disobedience comes from fear. The fact that we don't trust God to see us through. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus knew that God had a plan and that God would come through. Jesus Christ did not have pride but a, a life of humility. And we ought to exercise a life of obedience. You see, you can't be humble and disobedient at the same time. They don't go hand in hand. Humility and obedience, humility and submission go hand in hand. And if we want to live a life that glorifies God, that exalts God through us, a life of humility, we have got to understand that we have to submit to what God says and what God has for us today. Are you with me? Let me take you to one more verse, and we'll conclude with this. Can I take you to one more verse? In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in the fifth verse. 1 Peter 5, 5. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. I'll put it up on the overheads if you don't. 1 Peter, fifth chapter, fifth verse. We know this. And we'll get to it. You'll, you've heard it before. First Peter in the fifth chapter, in the fifth verse, here he's writing and he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Right there. Submit. We see the word submit, right? Okay. Yes, all of you. So first he's talking to the young people, saying, get rid of that pride. Submit yourself to your elders. But then he addresses everybody. All of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the what? The humble. So we see submit, submissive. Humility, humble. Submit, humble. Submit, humble. We want to be humble, submissive. You see how they go hand in hand? Look what he says. Verse number 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Look at verse number 7 says, this is where you know, you've heard this. If you've ever gone through a hard time, a Christian brother and sister has come to you and said, oh, brother, listen to this. The Bible says, cast your care upon him for he cares for you. You've gone through a hard time. Something's been going on and somebody said to you, oh, cast your cares on Jesus. 
Listen, I don't know about you. I've never, I haven't found that secret compartment yet where I can open up that secret hatch or that secret door and reach inside and grab my cares and my worries. And I can pull them out and like a baseball, I can throw them at God and say, here, God, here's my cares. I'm going to throw them at you. I haven't been able to do that. If you're able to do that, hey, I'd love to talk to you and you'd let me know where that secret compartment is. So when somebody says to you, oh, cast your cares upon he who cares for you, how do we do that? How do we cast our cares? The answer was in the previous verse, the first half, if you notice, that C right there, that's a lowercase because this is the middle of a thought. The answer to that is in verse number 6, going back to verse number 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Remember, humility and submission. Humility and submission are hand in hand. So what does that mean? How do we cast our cares upon God? We submit to God. If you've ever been in a car and you've ever driven somewhere, you know that the responsibility to get to the destination lies upon you, the driver. If you've ever been in the car with somebody else driving and you had to be somewhere and you showed up late, who was the first person you blamed? Oh, man, well, I tell you what, that driver, I, he made a left when he, sh he should have listened to me. I was trying to give him the directions. You've heard it before, the term, we call it a backseat driver. Why? Because the responsibility to get to the destination is not on the passenger, it's on the driver. And when we submit to God, if I can paint a visual picture for you, what we're doing is we're giving God the keys to our life and we're saying, God, no longer do I bear the burden to get to the destination that you have called, but now I'm going to give you the keys and I'm going to put the burden on you to get to that destination. And as the passengers, as the passengers to the life, you go on, you've been there. You get to sit in that seat and guess what you get to do? You get to look out the window. You get to enjoy the view. You get to see all the things that the driver doesn't get to see because they're focusing on the destination. So you want to know how do you cast your cares upon God? First and foremost, you have got to submit to God to allow him to be the leader of your life. And therefore, he has the burden. You see, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is like God does not intend for you and I to carry the weight of our journey alone, but rather to give him the keys to the car, to give him the keys to our life so that he can bear that burden, so that we can enjoy the ride and let him be exalted through us. So submission comes through humility. Today we talked about the workings of humility. Number one, humility. We have got to remain. It is our responsibility to remain humble. Number two this morning, talking about the workings of humility, it, was our, it is our responsibility to be the servant and not the served, looking after the example of Jesus Christ. And finally today, it is our responsibility, church, to be submissive to allow God to be the leader of our lives, to allow God to take the responsibility of our journey so that we can let him have the glory for it. Did you guys get something out of the word this morning? And hey, listen, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to ask everybody, please give me a moment more of your time. I want to ask you a very important question. And, I don't, and if you get up and walk around, everybody looks at you and, 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 and distracts them from, from, from their answers. So why don't you just give me a moment more of your time. Let me ask you this question. If you were to leave this place today and heaven forbid you were to die, your heart were to stop beating or whatever it was and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? That's the question. It's a relatively simple question. But why don't we go over some of those answers that you might have had in your heart or in your life? You know, nobody's going to know that answer really but, but you and God. So why don't we go over some of those answers that you might know and you might have said. Do you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think or hope or will your way into heaven? That because you want to get there, you're going to get there? You say, man, Pastor Luke, I really hope I get there. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you hope so, you think so, or you want to, that you're going to get into heaven. That God looks upon you and says, wow, they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to give it to them. Nowhere will you find that. Hey, did you know nowhere in the word of God does it say that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as a Muslim or any other type of world religion that that classifies you by default as a Christian and makes you get into heaven? Can you, can you, can you show me where it says in the word of God that there's a classification system that you get into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible. It's not about being born this or that or about this or that. It's not there. There's more to it than that. Hey, did you know? That because you were baptized as a baby or christened as a, as a child, 
because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter, that's not, that's not enough to get you into heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can get into heaven because you were baptized or christened. Nowhere in the Bible can you find that you're going to get into heaven because you went to church with your family on Christmas and on Easter. Hey, listen, nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that you're going to get into heaven because you call yourself a Christian because you've given yourself a title. It's just not that way. Did you know that you can't get to heaven by being a good person? So many people think that if they live a good life, if they've never robbed a 7-Eleven or they haven't cheated on their taxes, that means that they're going to get into heaven. Good people go to heaven. Hey, listen, I'm here to love you enough, to respect you enough, to honor you enough, to tell you the truth. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, because you live a good life, that you're going to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Hey, listen, did you know that you can't get to heaven because you memorized John 3, 16 and a few other verses? You can't get to heaven because you know who Jesus is or because you know about Paul or about Peter and about some of the stories? Did you know you can't get into heaven because you carried the pastor's Bible or volunteered in the youth ministry or, or you sang in the choir? Nowhere in the Bible does, does it say that. You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not going to get to heaven. The Bible shows us that the devil himself knows the scripture when he quoted it to Jesus in the temptation. Yet he's not on his way to heaven. Listen to this. In the book of John, in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to get into heaven? You can read it for yourself. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews is what it says. What does that mean to you and I? That means in our day and age, Nicodemus was like a Ph.D., means that Nicodemus had dedicated his young life to studying the Word of God. It means that Nicodemus had memorized more scripture than you and I could think imaginable. It means that Nicodemus gave to the poor. He was, a, he was allowed to teach in the temple, the church of his time. And you would think that when Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven, that Jesus would look to Nicodemus and pat him on the back and say, man, you just keep on going. But Jesus looks to Nicodemus and he says to him, you must be born again. Well, what does that mean? You've heard that term. You've heard what Hollywood and popular culture have made out of that. You think of radical, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in God's heart, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given him all of your heart and you've given him all of your life. You see, God's not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. God's after all of your heart all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove that to you in the book, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible in your Bible. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I, congregating together to hear the word of God. And he says to them, I know your deeds. When I come back, I better find you hot, he says, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. It's a gross, grotesque, shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that real Christ, or, or lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Lukewarm Christians do not make it into heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that to you in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that you're a little bit in and you're a little bit out, a little bit up and a little bit down. You're kind of floating around in your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance, a token prayer here and again. You know, you're doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. Not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. And Jesus Christ says, hey, if that's you living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. So then what do we do? How do we get into heaven? You know, we can't get to heaven your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way or author's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through him. So no matter how hard we try, the only way we could do it is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his Father. So here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. And when I hit my hand on the Bible, three. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible. And I want to give you the opportunity to get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. In a moment, when I smack my hand, if that's you in this place, I want you to get your hand up. By, by raising your hand, you know what you're doing? You're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. 
Hey, listen, you say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed, man. I, I don't think I could do that. The person next to me is going to know. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you do face embarrassment because you raised your hand in church, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't confess Jesus in a warm and welcome, loving place like the church today? You see, the decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. Each and every one of us have got to decide to go for Jesus all the way on our own. You see, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He's already done everything he could to connect us with him, to get us close to him in a relationship with him by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, a beaten, bloody, naked mess, to die a spectacle for the world to see so that you and I can now confess him before men and give him all of our heart and all of our life and, and get our place into heaven. Well, so who should raise their hands? If you've never given them all of your heart, if you've never given them all your hands in a moment, or all your heart and all your life, in a moment when I count to three, I want you to get your hand up. We'll do it all together at the same time. I'll see your hand. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hands? If you're not sure, think, man, maybe I did this as a kid, but I don't know if I've ever done this before. Then get your hands up. I'll see it. You can put it right back down. And finally, who should raise their hands today? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, today let's make it the day you go hot for God. Hey, today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out today. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. Get your hands up and we're all getting ready hands are getting ready to go up at this time life is but a vapor don't walk out of this place today without making sure here we go i'm going to count to three if that's you you've never done it get your hands up if you're not sure get your hands up if you've been living lukewarm messing around with god today let's make it the day you go forward for god on the count of three here we go one two three let me see your hands today i see you one two three four five six i saw was there a hand over here seven i see you Get your hands up so I can see it. Eight. Eight wise people. Where are you at? Let me see your hands. Nine. Ten. Ten wise people. Eleven. Okay, I see you. Eleven. Where are you at? Twelve. I see you in the back. Thirteen. Okay. Fourteen. I see you back there in the family rooms. Fifteen. All right, Usher, I see you. Anybody in the family rooms? Fifteen wise people. Sixteen. I got you over there. I see you pointing over there. I can't see. Seventeen. In the family rooms. Eighteen. I see you over there. Where's number nineteen? I see an Usher pointing. Where are you at? Give me a little wave. 19, I see you. Where are you at? Number 20. If, you, if there's 19, you know there's 20. Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, where are you at today? Let's go forward for God. Let me see your hands. I see people pointing over in this direction. Number 20, where are you at? 20, I see you, brother. Praise God for, for 20 wise people. Hallelujah. A few more all across. Praise God. Well, here's what I want to do for the 20 of you that raised your hand or the 20-some 20, 20 of you. I know there's a few more of you in this place. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, but it's, it's not too late. I want to do something in a moment. We're going to sing a song together and we're all going to stand. And when we stand, I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give them all of your heart, all of your life. Let us help you today. I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, grab your purse, your sweater, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat from the family rooms, from the back, from the front. It doesn't matter where you're at. Be bold and come. You said you want to give them all of your heart, all of your life. Come on, get out into the aisles and come meet me up here today. Let us help you. If that's you, you come. Come on, it's not too late. You come on. Come on, from the family rooms, from the back, if you raise your hand, come on up here. You come, come on, you're not too young. You're not too old. If that's you, you come. Oh, I am decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Come on down. Come on down. Come home to Jesus. Come on. Listen, there's, there's about two-thirds of, of those of you who raised your hands up here today. You don't get saved by raising your hands. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. It's not too late. We'll wait for you. If that's you, if you raise your hand or you need to get out, of, if you need to raise your hand, you need to get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me up here at the altar today. Let us help you go forward for God. If that's you, come on, let's go forward for God and come meet me up here at the altar today. If that's you, come on. You can come. <laughs>
Well, I can't make you come. I can't force you. That's between you and God. But for those of you who are up here, I want to say something. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and God is going to touch you in, 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 in ways that you can't even imagine. He's going to bless you. But listen, here, I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy you will meet, all right? He's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer to go to get Jesus Christ in your heart and your life. He's going to give you some free things, some free literature to say, hey, I just got saved. What do I do now to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord? And he's going to invite you into a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer, somebody helps you build muscles, to make sure you're working the muscles the right way to get strong. Well, we have per spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you before service for four weeks, teach you some things about the ways of the Lord to get you strong so you don't go back to the past that you came from and be strong in the ways of the Lord. And I want to ask one more thing of you. You got saved here. You got, you, you, the Lord touched you here. I want to ask you to commit to sit 12 months, one year, at the church, to, to listen to the Word of God, get into the church as often as you can, because that's where you got fed. This is where the Lord speaks to you, to get into the church and sit under the teachings of the Lord for 12 months here. I'm not asking you to join or a cult or anything like that, but I'm asking you to listen to the Word of God here at the Brock Church and World Art Center for 12 months. And I promise you, 365 days from today, if you allow God to speak to you, I promise you, you will look back one year from today and say, wow, I can't believe what God has done in my life. So if you guys would just go right over here with Pastor Dave.